During the American Civil War, Maryland, a slave state, was one of the border states, straddling the South and North. Because of its strategic location, bordering the capital city of Washington, D.C., and the strong desire of the opposing factions within the state to sway public opinion towards their respective causes, Maryland would play an important role in the American Civil War. Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus in Maryland and dismissal of the Supreme Court's chief justices ruling that such suspension was unconstitutional would leave lasting scars. The first fatalities of the war happened during the Baltimore riot of April 1861, and the single bloodiest day of combat in American military history occurred near Sharpsburg, Maryland, at the Battle of Antietam. On 17 September 1862, Antietam, though tactically a draw, was strategically enough of a Union victory to give President Abraham Lincoln the opportunity to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared slaves in the Confederacy to be free. Later, in July 1864, the Battle of Monica Sea was fought on Maryland soil. Monica Sea was a tactical victory for the Confederate Army but a strategic defeat, as the delay inflicted on the Confederates cost General Jubal early his chance to capture the Union capital of Washington, D.C. Across the state, nearly 85,000 citizens signed up for the military, with most joining the Union Army. Approximately one-third as many enlisted to fight for the Confederacy. The most prominent Maryland leaders and officers during the Civil War included Governor Thomas H. Higgs who, despite his early sympathies for the South, helped prevent the state from seceding, and Confederate General George H. Stewart, who was a noted brigade commander under Robert E. Lee. The end of the war would bring the abolition of slavery in Maryland, with a new constitution voted in 1864 by a small majority. Animosity against Lincoln would remain, and Marylander John Wilkes Booth would assassinate President Lincoln in April 1865, crying, Six Emperor tyrannize, as he did so. The approach of war. Maryland's sympathies Maryland, as a slaveholding border state was deeply divided over the antebellum arguments over states' rights and the future of slavery in the Union. Culturally, geographically and economically, Maryland found herself neither one thing nor another, a unique blend of southern agrarianism and northern mercantilism. In the lead-up to the American Civil War, it became clear that the state was bitterly divided in its sympathies. There was much less appetite for secession than elsewhere in the southern states, but Maryland was equally unsympathetic towards the potentially abolitionist position of Republican candidate Abraham Lincoln. In the presidential election of 1860 Lincoln won just 2,294 votes out of a total of 92,421, only 2.5% of the votes cast, coming in at a distant fourth place. In seven counties, Lincoln received not a single vote. The areas of southern and eastern Maryland, especially those on the Chesapeake Bay, which had prospered on the tobacco trade and slave labor, were generally sympathetic to the south while northern and western areas of the state, especially Marylanders of German origin, had stronger economic ties to the north. Not all blacks in Maryland were slaves. The 1860 federal census showed there were nearly as many free blacks as slaves in Maryland. However, across the state, sympathies were mixed. Many Marylanders were simply pragmatic, recognizing that the state's long border with pro-Union Pennsylvania would be almost impossible to defend in the event of war. Maryland businessmen feared the likely loss of trade that would be caused by war and the strong possibility of a blockade of Baltimore's port by the Union Navy. Other residents did not want to be involved in a war against their neighbors on either side and sought to avoid a military response by Lincoln to the South Secession. After John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in 1859, many citizens began forming local militias, determined to prevent a future slave uprising. 
Baltimore riot of 1861 The first bloodshed of the Civil War occurred in Maryland. Anxious about the risk of secessionists capturing Washington, D.C., given that the capital was bordered by Virginia in the south and Maryland in the north, the federal government requested armed volunteers to suppress unlawful combinations in the south. Soldiers from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts were transported by rail to Baltimore, where they had to disembark, march through the city, and board another train to continue their journey south to Washington. As one Massachusetts regiment was transferred between stations on April 19, a group of secessionists and southern sympathizers attacked the train cars and blocked the route. Some began throwing cobblestones and bricks at the troops assaulting them with shouts and stones. Panicked by the situation, several soldiers fired into the mob, whether accidentally, in a desultory manner, or by the command of the officers, is unclear. Chaos ensued as a giant brawl began between fleeing soldiers, the violent mob, and the Baltimore police who tried to suppress the violence. Four soldiers and twelve civilians were killed in the riot. The song's lyrics urged Marylanders to spurn the northern scum and burst the tyrant's chain, in other words, to secede from the Union. Confederate States Army bands would later play the song after they crossed into Maryland territory during the Maryland Campaign in 1862. After the April 19 rioting, skirmishes continued in Baltimore for the next month. Mayor George William Brown and Maryland Governor Thomas Hicks implored President Lincoln to reroute troops around Baltimore City and through Annapolis to avoid further confrontations. In a letter to President Lincoln, Mayor Brown wrote, It is my solemn duty to inform you that it is not possible for more soldiers to pass through Baltimore unless they fight their way at every step. I therefore hope and trust and most earnestly request that no more troops be permitted or ordered by the government to pass through the city. If they should attempt it, the responsibility for the bloodshed will not rest upon me. Hearing no immediate reply from Washington, on the evening of April 19, Governor Hicks and Mayor Brown ordered the destruction of railroad bridges leading into the city from the north, preventing further incursions by Union soldiers. The destruction was accomplished the next day. For a time, it looked as if Maryland might join the rebels, but Lincoln moved swiftly to defuse the situation, promising that the troops were needed purely to defend Washington, not to attack the South. President Lincoln also complied with the request to reroute troops to Annapolis, as the political situation in Baltimore remained highly volatile. Meanwhile, General Winfield Scott, who was in charge of military operations in Maryland indicated in correspondence with the head of Pennsylvania troops that the route through Baltimore would resume once sufficient troops were available to secure Baltimore, to secede or not to secede despite considerable popular support for the cause of the Confederate States of America. Maryland would not secede during the Civil War. However, a number of leading citizens, including physician and slaveholder Richard Spriggs Stewart, placed considerable pressure on Governor Hicks to summon the state legislature to vote on secession, following Hicks to Annapolis with a number of fellow citizens, to insist on his, Hicks, issuing his proclamation for the legislature to convene, believing that this body should decide the fate of our state, if the governor and his party continued to refuse this demand that it would be, necessary to depose him. Responding to pressure, on April 22, Governor Hicks finally announced that the state legislature would meet in a special session in Frederick, a strongly pro-Union town, rather than the state capital of Annapolis. The Maryland General Assembly convened in Frederick and unanimously adopted a measure stating that they would not commit the state to secession, explaining that they had no constitutional authority to take such action, whatever their own personal feelings might have been. On April 29, the legislature voted 53 to 13 against secession, though they also voted not to reopen rail links with the North.
and they requested that Lincoln remove Union troops from Maryland. At this time the legislature seems to have wanted to maintain Maryland's neutrality in the conflict. Imposition of martial law The political situation in Maryland remained uncertain until May 13, 1861 when General Benjamin F. Butler entered Baltimore by rail with 1,000 federal soldiers and, under cover of a thunderstorm, quietly took possession of Federal Hill. Butler fortified his position and trained his guns upon the city, threatening its destruction. Butler then sent a letter to the commander of Fort McHenry. I have taken possession of Baltimore. My troops are on Federal Hill, which I can hold with the aid of my artillery. If I am attacked tonight, please open upon Monument Square with your mortars. Butler went on to occupy Baltimore and declared martial law. In order to prevent any further likelihood of secession or hindrance the war being made on the South, by May 21 there was no need to send further troops. After the occupation of the city, Union troops were garrisoned throughout the state. By late summer Maryland was firmly in the hands of Union soldiers. Arrests of Confederate sympathizers soon followed, and Stuart's brother, the militia general George H. Stuart, fled to Charlottesville, Virginia, after which much of his family's property was confiscated by the federal government. Civil authority in Baltimore was swiftly withdrawn from all those who had not been steadfastly in favor of the federal government's emergency measures. During this period in spring 1861, Baltimore Mayor Brown, the city council, the police commissioner, and the entire board of police were arrested and imprisoned at Fort McHenry without charges. One of those arrested was militia captain John Merriman, who was held without trial in defiance of a writ of habeas corpus on May 25, sparking the case of ex party Merriman, heard just two days later on May 27 and 28. In this case U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice and native Marylander, Roger B. Taney, acting as a federal circuit court judge, ruled that the arrest of Merriman was unconstitutional without congressional authorization, which Lincoln could not then secure. The president, under the Constitution and laws of the United States, cannot suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus nor authorize any military officer to do so. Merriman created a sensation, but its immediate impact was rather limited, as the government and the army simply ignored the ruling. Indeed, when Lincoln's dismissal of Justice Taney's ruling was criticized in an editorial by Francis Scott Key's grandson, Baltimore newspaper editor Frank Key Howard, he was himself arrested without trial. In 1863 Howard wrote about his experience as a political prisoner at Fort McHenry in the book 14 Months in the American Bastille. Two of the publishers selling the book were then arrested. One third of the members of the Maryland General Assembly were arrested on September 17, 1861, the first day of the legislature's new session, because of intelligence suggesting that the Assembly would aid the anticipated rebel invasion and would attempt to take the state out of the Union. Sitting U.S. Congressman from Maryland Henry May was also arrested without recourse to habeas corpus on suspicion of treason and held in Fort Lafayette. May was eventually released and returned to his seat in Congress in December 1861. In March 1862 he introduced a bill to Congress requiring the federal government to either indict by grand jury or release all other political prisoners still held without habeas. The provisions of May's bill were included in the March 1863 Habeas Corpus Act in which Congress finally authorized Lincoln to suspend habeas corpus but required actual indictments for suspected traitors. Flight to Virginia Many Marylanders sympathetic to the South easily crossed the Potomac River into secessionist Virginia in order to join and fight for the Confederacy. During the early summer of 1861, several thousand Marylanders crossed the Potomac to join the Confederate Army. Most of the men enlisted into regiments from Virginia or the Carolinas. But six companies of Marylanders formed at Harper's Ferry into the Maryland Battalion, 
Among them were members of the former volunteer militia unit, the Maryland Guard Battalion, initially formed in Baltimore in 1859. Maryland exiles, including Arnold Elsley and Brigadier General George H. Stewart, would organize a Maryland line in the Army of Northern Virginia which eventually consisted of one infantry regiment one infantry battalion, two cavalry battalions and four battalions of artillery. Most of these volunteers tended to hail from southern and eastern counties of the state, while northern and western Maryland furnished more volunteers for the Union armies. Captain Bradley T. Johnson refused the offer of the Virginians to join a Virginia regiment, insisting that Maryland should be represented independently in the Confederate Army. It was agreed that Arnold Eltsley, a seasoned career officer from Maryland, would command the 1st Maryland Regiment. His executive officer was the Marylander George H. Stewart, who would later be known as Maryland Stewart, to distinguish him from his more famous cavalry colleague J.E.B. Stewart. The 1st Maryland Infantry Regiment was officially formed on June 16, 1861, and, on June 25, Two additional companies joined the regiment in Winchester. Its initial term of duty was for 12 months. It has been estimated that, of the state's 1860 population of 687,000, up to 25,000 Marylanders traveled south to fight for the Confederacy while about 60,000 Maryland men served in all branches of the Union military. One notable Maryland frontline regiment was the 2nd Maryland Infantry, which saw considerable combat action in the Union 9th Corps, a state divided not all those who sympathized with the rebels would abandon their homes and join the Confederacy. Some, like physician Richard Sprigg Stewart, remained in Maryland, offered covert support for the South, and refused to sign an oath of loyalty to the Union. Later in 1861, Baltimore resident W. W. Glenn described Stewart as a fugitive from the authorities. I was spending the evening out when a footstep approached my chair from behind and a hand was laid upon me. I turned and saw Dr. R. S. Stewart. He has been concealed for more than six months. His neighbors are so bitter against him that he dare not go home and he committed himself so decidedly on the 19th of April and is known to be so decided a southerner, that it more than likely he would be thrown into a fort. He goes about from place to place, sometimes staying in one county, sometimes in another and then passing a few days in the city. He never shows in the daytime and is cautious who sees him at any time.